Hi and blessings to you all. Now this video is not uh, what I would typically normally do. This is a slight departure in that it's not based on a dream or a vision from the Lord. Instead this is a teaching that I prepared for a group of us that have begun meeting monthly to explore the scriptures in depth. It's a teaching about the Bride of Christ and when the Lord called me to be a watchwoman some five or so years ago he made it clear that my part was to be a cleaning lady to prepare the Bride of Christ for his return, especially as he showed me at that time that she was or we are, we were, we are not ready. I therefore felt after prayer that it was relevant to share this teaching as I very much hope that it will draw us to a deeper understanding of who the bride is, who she, we is called to be and draw us all closer to the heart of our bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, so that when the trumpet does sound or sooner, if our time is up, and as I always say, none of us is promised tomorrow, that we may be found worthy to be part of that bride and that we may be ready to be called up to meet him in the air. So what follows now is the teaching that I prepared for our first meeting last week. So as I've set this up, I felt it should be me to lead the first session, which I do with great trepidation, as you are all giants and you know so much and have experienced so much more than I have. So please bear with me as you um, listen to me this evening. So forgive me if I share things that you already know, but I do hope to be able to share at least some things today that are new to you. And as mentioned in the invitation, the plan would be for us to discuss what topics we would like to study when we meet and share the opportunities around to teach as we go. But, well, today you've got me. So I asked the Lord what we should do for our first week and I felt that he led me back to um, part of my waking up process five years ago, which ultimately is the foundation, foundational purpose for all of us, uh, which is that we are called to be the Bride of Messiah. At that time he gave me a dream and showed me that uh, he was coming back for his bride and the bride was not ready but she was rather more like the lukewarm church that is spoken of in Revelation. He called me to be a cleaning lady and I felt very strongly that this is, as this is part of my calling I should try to stay faithful to it. As I also mentioned in the invitation, in order that this can be a safe space to share and learn together, it is our aim that we explore topics without becoming divided over contentious or peripheral issues, which is no easy task, but let's strive to. And clearly the timing of the taking of the bride is just one such issue, as people disagree over a pre-trib or a mid-trib or a post-trib or a pre-wrath rapture or harpazo as it's called in the Greek in 1 Thessalonians 4 for instance. So I will do my best to avoid that aspect for the here and now. It's our calling to be the bride of Christ. Um, how this has been God's plan since creation and how this is hidden in his word since then and how this is hidden in the Jewish cultural traditions uh, revealing what would have been understood by Jesus Yeshua and his contemporaries and also what Hebrew word studies of the bride and the bridegroom reveal about God's beautiful heart towards his bride. So starting with the end from the beginning, because God does say in the Bible that he, he knows the end from the beginning, um, we're going to start with a, with a spoiler alert. So this is where, where we end up at the end uh, in the book of Revelation 19, verse 7 to 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And Paul also describes this as a mystery in uh, Ephesians 5, when he talks about the fact that this is um, a great mystery, but I speak concerning the Christ, uh, Christ and the Church when he's talking about marriage, human marriage, between a husband and a wife. But he speaks of how actually Jesus, Yeshua, 
plans to sanctify and cleanse us with the washing of the water by the word so that we one day will not have any spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that we should be holy and without blemish to be presented to him as a glorious bride now obviously these are both uh, new testament scriptures but uh, this is not just a new testament context concept this is what a mystery is a mystery is not something that we can't know but it was something that was hidden in the past which is made revealed in the latter times so uh, from the beginning it was hidden and it is my aim to go back and to try and find the, the bride hidden in the word from the beginning in types traditions and even in the fabric of the words now with regard to types and typologies i have read that types and anti-types models and allegories were the accepted method of interpreting scripture by the rabbis in jesus's time and it has been said that the type is perhaps the least understood but the most important concept in the hermeneutics of Bible prophecy. So I will be looking at those. I also want to touch on traditional Jewish Bible interpretations. And there are four methods, I beg your pardon, four levels of understanding scripture that are acknowledged. And this is what Chabad has to say about them. It says that there are these four levels, Peshat, Remez, Drash and Sod. And that uh, Peshat is the simple interpretation of the Torah. For example, in Genesis 1.1, it says, In the beginning God created heaven and the heaven and the earth. And that means exactly what it seems to me in a very literal sense. Uh, but there's also the Remez, which are, are different hints and allusions which are contained within the Torah. Uh, one of the methodologies that the Torah employs would be to make these hints is, is gematria, which is the numbers, the numerical value of the different letters of the Hebrew alphabet. For example, the gematria of Bereshit bara, in the beginning created, is the same as berosh hashashana nivra haolam, or rosh hashana, on rosh hashana, which is the uh, Jewish New Year, the world was created. So Bereshit bara and Berosh Hashanah Nivra are both 1,116 in Hebrew gematria. The next level down, <coughs> the drush or the drush or the midrash, expounds upon the deeper meaning of the verse. So, for example, uh, in the beginning is Bereshit, and the midrash, it says, tells us that this word can be split into two words, Ber and Reshit, Be and Reshit. And the Torah is telling us that the world was created for two, be, reshits, firsts. And from a Jewish perspective, they would interpret that as meaning the Jews and the Torah. Uh, for myself, and perhaps for others, mess more messianic people, um, I would say that be reshit can mean in the first fruits, be reshit, in the first fruits, God created. And we know that Jesus, Yeshua, is our first fruits, and in him the worlds were created. So that's hidden there in the word Bereshit. And then you have the Sod, the meaning, the hidden secret, the esoteric, mystical part of Torah. And according to Chabad, <coughs> uh, the Tikkunet Zoha, a book which gives 70 different explanations for the word Bereshit, it apparently can be split, for example, into bara shis, which means created with six. And according to Chabad, to Jewish thinking, this is because the world was created through God's six emotional powers, kindness, severity, beauty, victory, splendor, and foundation. So for myself, uh, from a more messianic perspective, <clears throat> I would say that this rather hints that it was created in, se in six days. And as we know, a day unto the Lord is a thousand years. So it was created for man's rule of 6,000 years, after which we have the millennium, the Shabbat, of Yeshua's rule. So Bereshit is actually one of my favourite verses. I've had it made on a ring. But anyway, that's by the by. So, And of course, Bereshit is a whole other study for another day. So I will just return to the bride and the Jewish weddings right now. But as we go, <clears throat> please keep the types and typologies and the different levels of interpretation in your mind. 
So starting with the wedding traditions, we see that according to Jewish wedding traditions, the bride was chosen by the father and had to be of similar rank as his family, of good social standing, um, with similar life experiences, similar expectations, similar, a good reputation and so forth. Well, we know that when God created the world, he created each after its own kind and he expected and designed us all and all creation that we should stick to our kinds and not cross over, irrespective of what uh, certain um, groups of people are trying to do, for example, with CRISPR technology and trying to create hybrids and transhumanism. That was not God's plan. So God limited uh, creation to its kinds. And he also said that we are not to be unequally yoked. However, so although we are human and Jesus Yeshua is obviously God, when we are born again, we become a new creation in him. And it, the, the word tells us that we are being changed from glory to glory into the likeness of his son. So although we will never obviously be God, we are being changed somehow into the likeness of Yeshua, which therefore qualifies to us to be considered as a possible bride in a way that people who are not born again cannot be. So I find that very beautiful. The bridegroom, well, the bridegroom would be around about 30 years or so old when he began uh, looking for his bride and uh, or introducing himself to his bride, visiting his bride. And we know that Jesus Yeshua was 30 when he began his ministry. And the process begins with a visitation when the father and the son visited the prospective family. And we know that throughout history, God has visited humankind. He was there in the Garden of Eden. He was there in the tabernacle, in the pillars of fire and smoke. Yeshua was there in his theophanies, his uh, pre-incarnate visitations. And he was, of course, there when he was incarnated into the person of Jesus, Yeshua, the Son of God. The next step <clears throat> involves three things. There is the written proposal or contract which is the ketubah there is a cash payment or bride price which is called the moha and a wine skin was also necessary now as for the moha this is uh, as i say this is the cash gift that the groom gives to the bride and we see these types in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, God gave gifts to Abraham. In Genesis 15, he said, I am your protector, your very great reward. And he promised also to give the land of Israel, Eretz Israel, <clears throat> to Abraham and his people forever. And in the New Testament, of course, of paramount importance is what Jesus Yeshua did on the cross by offering himself up and giving up his life on the cross, he paid the bride price with his blood. So the next part is the ketubah, which was the prenuptial agreement, which had the responsibilities of both parties. And the sages consider that the difference between a wife and a concubine was the existence of a ketubah. If you didn't have a ketubah, you were not a bride, a wife, you were just a concubine. In the Old Testament, the Torah is often considered the ketubah, or even the Ten Commandments specifically. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is seen in many Jewish Sephardic congregations even today. Apparently, prior to the Torah reading on the first day of Shavuot or Pentecost, a ketubah le Shavuot, a marriage certificate for Shavuot, is read as a symbolic betrothal of God and his people Israel. So it's still shown today that this is considered to be the ketubah. And the Ten Commandments, this ketubah, is not just to be seen as a list of dictatorial prohibitions. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Ten Commandments, or the Torah, is praised as, as good and holy and life-giving and a blessing and a gift. 
a delight, in fact. This is what it said about it, for example, in Psalm 119, as also in the New Testament in Romans 7, 12. Therefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. It is not a burdensome thing. It is not a restrictive thing. On the contrary, this is God's guidance for us to lead us into life and, and peace and freedom freedom from sin, freedom from slavery to sin. It is actually a wonderful gift of love to us. And I will come back to this at the end of what I want to share today. Now, as for the Ketubah in the New Testament, well, in Matthew 15, we read that Jesus fulfilled the law. But if you look at the meaning of the word fulfill, plural, it actually means to expand, to fill out, or to complete. It does not mean to bring to an end. Jesus fulfilled the law in several ways. He obeyed it perfectly, but also he taught its correct meaning. And we see this very clearly in this context of Matthew 5, 17 to 18. He says, do not think I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. In other words, to properly explain it. Because he says, heaven and earth will pass away, but by no means will any part of this law pass away. And the word in Greek is plirou, which means to fully teach, to explain correctly, to fill out, to expand or complete. It does not mean to bring to an end. And we think about the context of this. When Jesus Yeshua said this, he said, for example, you have heard it taught that thou shalt not murder. I say to you, and you have heard it taught do not commit adultery, I say to you. And he explained that if you, for instance, look at a woman with lust, you have committed adultery in your heart. So a better way of looking at it is to say that Moses wrote it down and Jesus explained it and he lived it out. He taught it verbally and he taught it by living it out. So the New Testament actually is the is our, is our Ketubah, which is written out in full, the whole of the New Testament. And it is written in our hearts as promised in Jeremiah 31. So that is our New Testament Ketubah, which I think, again, is just really very, very beautiful. So there is the Ketubah, the Torah in the Old Testament, the New Testament, Matthew 15, explained in the word pleru, which incidentally is also in Romans 15, I think, where Paul said, I have plerud the New Testament, I don't, the gospel. I don't think he meant he brought the gospel to an end. No, he meant he had fully taught it. The next part we come to is the wineskin. So when the negotiations were finished, the bride in Jewish traditions was offered a cup of wine and as a sign of her acceptance she would drink from it and at that point then the couple were betrothed in fact legally married and we see this in Matthew 26 that Yeshua poured wine for his disciples at the supper before his crucifixion the disciples drank from the cup accepting the contract the sign of the covenant agreement when he said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. This was that cup and they drank to show their acceptance. And in the Old Testament, we see this in Genesis 14, 18 to 20, when Melchizedek, Melchid, Mel, Mel, I can't say it, Melchizedek, Melchizedek brought bread and wine to Abraham and he accepted them. So that was when this agreement, this cup was drunk to show that they were betrothed at that point. <clears throat> the next thing that would happen in a traditional Jewish wedding was that his, uh, the mother of the bridegroom would crown him with a garland of flowers on this very special day of his espousals. And uh, soon after being crowned, he would be gone. Well, we know that Jesus Yeshua was crowned with a crown of thorns. In Judges 9.14 and in other places, Satan is depicted as a thorn bush. In Judges 9.14, it says, Then all the trees said to the thorn bush, You come and reign over us. They accepted Satan's reign, just as Adam did when he uh, accepted the fruit of the tree, and as we all have when we, in our own way, have eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil by sinning. 
And by wearing the symbol of Satan on his head when he went to the cross, I believe that Jesus Yeshua fulfilled Genesis 3.15, crushing Satan's head on the cross. The next part was the betrothal. And at this point, well, we see in Genesis, from Genesis 16, which was after Abraham accepted the betrothal to God, uh, the betrothal lasted until Moses. And in the New Testament, uh, it is spoken of in John 14, because at that time the bridegroom would promise to return, but he would say he would go away to prepare a place for his bride in his father's house. Now that should sound familiar from John 14 too. As I say, in the Old Testament we see that this was from Genesis 16 up to Moses, and that was the time uh, when God went away to prepare the land, for Israel to move the, the children of Israel to move in and I say in the New Testament we see this in John 14 verse 2 where he says in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so I would have told you so I go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also and this word receive to myself is the word in Greek of paralambano and it means to receive near it is um, to receive unto oneself as a friend or a companion and uh, interestingly this is the very same word that is used in Matthew 24 when it says at that time uh, there will be two in the field, one will be taken and the other one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, the one will be taken and the other one left. It is the same word for the one to be taken, is paralambano. And the one to be left is the word afiemi, which actually means to be divorced. It, it's used elsewhere in the New Testament to mean divorce. So here we have a picture of the snatching of the bride, the one that is paralambano, that is that is snatched up and taken to be a friend or companion as opposed to the others who are left behind and divorced. So during that time uh, the bridegroom promises that he will abstain from alcohol and we see that in Matthew 26 29 when Yeshua says I tell you I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink of it anew with you in my father's kingdom. So he promised to drink only on the day of them of their marriage and not until then when they were in the father's house at that time also the bridegroom would leave gifts for his bride uh, very often he would leave for example some a length of linen fabric that she would then sew into her wedding garment and uh, we see that in Revelation 19 when the bride has beautified herself, her garments, with the, uh, the, the righteous acts that are prepared beforehand for us that we should walk in them. These are our garments of righteousness in Revelation 19. And we're left with many gifts. We are left with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we are left with many great and precious promises. We are left with everything that is needful for life and godliness. We are left with the promise that we can be partake, partakers of the divine nature in 2 Peter verse 1. And in Ephesians 4, 8, it says, When he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and he gave gifts to men. And uh, it is also spoken of in Isaiah, in Job, and in Psalm 132. It speaks of garments of salvation and righteousness. But we should not only just focus on the gifts that were left, as in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but we must remember that we are given the gift of the Holy Spirit himself as a deposit for us, uh, for, to show that he will fulfill his promise to come and paralambano us, to take us to be with him forever. When the bridegroom leaves, he says he will go and prepare a place for us. And then he has to wait until the time when the father says, son, go and get your bride. It's not the son who decides when to go. It's the father who decides when to send the bride. And this is very reminiscent of what Jesus, Yeshua, says in the New Testament. He says, uh, no one knows that day or hour, not even the son, not the angels, but only the father. 
And this would have resonated with the disciples. They would have understood that he was talking about a wedding because this was the vernacular of the Jewish traditional wedding of the time. And just like Jesus left with the angels promising that he would return in like manner in, in Acts 1 verse 11, uh, in, this, uh, in the same way Jesus will come again as he promised in John 14 uh, to, to, to take us to be with him and so that we may always be with him from that point onwards. And as I say, in like manner, in the Old Testament, God went away, as it were, to prepare the land of Israel for his people until the time of their marriage on Mount Sinai with Moses after they had been brought out of the land of Egypt. So then in preparation for the wedding, the bride would have to do her part and she would have to go through what's called a mikveh, which is a ceremonial bath or a baptism. And one could see the crossing of the Red Sea as a mikveh. And in Exodus 19.10, the people were to told to go and wash their clothes in preparation and could very well have gone through a mikveh of sorts at that time. We also know that Joshua, who is a type of Jesus, crossed the Jordan as a type of Messiah. And we ourselves are called to be baptised and called to keep our garments clean in Scripture. During the period of betrothal, the bride wore a veil. And we are waiting to be revealed as the sons of God. We are veiled. It is not yet apparent uh, what we shall be. And we know in Romans 8.19 that it says that all creation is growing for the sons of God to be revealed. Very importantly, during that time, the bride would watch. And we read about the importance of watching in Luke 24, where it says, Take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness and the cares of this life, that that day come on you unexpectedly, for it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. So we must be careful, not just to, should we not be living in a worldly fleshly manner, carousing and drunkenness, but also not allowing ourselves to take our eyes off Jesus, Yeshua, and to look upon all the dreadful things that are going on in this world because we become worn down and weighed down with the cares of this world. And this can distract us and could cause us to be unprepared for that day, which will be a snare. So let's not do that. We must keep watching, watching our bridegroom and watching for our bridegroom. So the bride would watch for his return. And we, of course, we know the story of the ten virgins, uh, that there were some who were not watching and not prepared. They were not refreshing their oil. They were not obeying the, the exhortation that we must be being filled with the Holy Spirit repeatedly. And as a result, they were shut out at the wedding. So brothers and sisters, please be being filled with the oil of the Holy Spirit daily. Keep a short account, keep yourself cleansed, keep yourself in the word, keep yourself in conversation with the Lord. Be living in a way that is obedient, set apart and holy. Keep your garments clean. And in the end, when it was time for him to come, the bridegroom would come uh, with a shout and the sound of the shofar, the, the ram's horn trumpet, that would cut be at midnight, according to the scriptures and according to a tradition. And it says uh, that on, uh, on Mount Sinai, there was the sound of the trumpet. It said in the Old Testament, when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by his voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on top of the mountain and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mountain and Moses went up and this is paralleled so beautifully in 1 Thessalonians 4 16 to 17 where we read for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall be always with the Lord so that Yeshua will come down to the clouds, not all the way down to earth at this point, And we will go up to meet him in the clouds with those who have already risen from the dead. Absolutely wonderful. 
The next part then is the home taking or the nisuin, which is the procession of lifting the bride uh, up. And it was, as I say, called the nisuin and was called the home taking. The word comes from the Hebrew word nasa, which means to lift up, to bear, to carry away. And the bride is carried on poles like the Ark of the Covenant. And we know the Ark of the Covenant received Yeshua's blood at his death. And the bride is sanctified and covered with his blood. It's a beautiful parallel there. On arriving at the father's house, the bride would see the chuppah. There's a picture of the chuppah. And the groom took his place under it. And as he did so, the guests would recite, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And we've heard that before. So we can see similarities here and parallels in both Old and New Testament. For we see that on, in, on Mount Sinai, um, in Exodus 19, verse 16 and 18, there was smoke and cloud on the mountain. It was enveloped in smoke because Adonai descended onto it in fire. And Moses went up into the smoke on the mountain. And we also see it, as I've just read, in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, that we meet the Lord in the clouds. Now, the chuppah itself is interesting. I've learnt something new here. Uh, in, in the old traditions, the chuppah was made of two trees which was planted by the two families. So the, the wedding could have been planned from when the, the children, when, from when the bride and the groom were children. So for a very long time, so the two families each planted a tree and they would cut down the tree and they would make the chuppah uh, out of the, uh, these two, two trees. And uh, we know that uh, Jesus uh, made a chuppah out of the cross because it was made of two trees. Uh, his cross was the tree of his sacrificial death. And for us as the other family, our tree is the tree of life which we receive. The tree of life was once dead to us, but now it has sprung back to life like Aaron's rod because of what our bridegroom has done. And the Holy Spirit is a canopy of comfort and protection as he hovers over us like a dove. And yes, there's a canopy you can see over the chuppah there. So in the same way that the Holy Spirit hovered over creation, in the same way he hovers over us as we, the Bride of Christ, are a new creation in Yeshua. At the wedding, the bride circles the bridegroom seven times and, uh, we, uh, and they listen again to the reading of the ketubah and they finally share the fourth cup of wine, which is the fourth cup from the Passover Haggadah, which is called the cup of redemption. And we know that Jesus promised that he would not drink again until uh, he came into his kingdom and we see the parallel in in exodus where it says that moses took half the blood and put it in the basin and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar and he took the book of the covenant and he read in the hearing of the people this is like the ketubah being read again and they all said all that the lord has said we will do and be agreed in obedient they agreed and Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you to do according to all these words. And we know that Yeshua promised he would drink again with us on our wedding day. After this is done, the couple then would withdraw for seven days. And after the marriage was consummated, there would be a marriage feast, which we read about in, um, in Revelation 19. Unfortunately, on Mount Sinai, the children of Israel rode, rose up to play and celebrate, but they, instead of encircling the bride, bridegroom, they encircled and they drank to a golden calf, the Egyptian idol, instead of to Adonai, immediately committing adultery, grounds for divorce. And on the seventh day, when the celebration has ended, the couple would traditionally leave the father's house and depart for their new home and their new life together. And this is implied as the Lord returning to earth at the end of the tribulation before the millennium where he will stand on Mount Sinai before his millennial rule on earth. And we see that uh, this is prophesied by Jude in uh, Jude 1.14. 
when he says that the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints in the same way that the bride and the bridegroom depart together for their new home so Yeshua will return with his bride with the ten thousands of his saints on that amazing day so these are the types and typologies that we can find in the Jewish wedding traditions uh, which are clearly uh, paralleled in the both the Old and the New Testament so the next thing I want to look at is actual typologies of the brides uh, which are in the Bible now um, it would be impossible to explore them all uh, here today but I will give some highlights of seven Old Testament bride types but I will restrict myself to exploring one in a little bit more depth which is Eve and I've chosen her because I am looking for the bride from the beginning and she is the first bride type in the word so thinking about going back to the very beginning it is important I think to consider that when God created Adam uh, or, although she was brought forth later she actually Eve was part of Adam when he was originally created you can see it says male and female created he them but in the second line here you can say he called them man he called them Adam so Adam and Eve or Eve within Adam was called Adam was called man so she was in him from the beginning and we see that in Ephesians 1 4 and 6 that in the same way somehow we were chosen and, and said to be in Christ or in him beforehand so Adam was before Eve although she was in him and she was brought out of him and Yeshua has existed in eternity thereby pre-existing all things but somehow we were in his mind long before creation and long before the bride of Yeshua could ever be brought forth so as I say we see this here in, in Genesis 1 27 and in Ephesians 1 4 verse 6 and also we see that Adam didn't begin his reign over creation until he had his bride in Genesis 1 28 it says that God told them to fulfill the earth to subdue it and to have dominion over it and likewise Yeshua will not begin his physical reign over the earth until his bride begins her reign with him so the word for bride is kala in Hebrew and I've read that it comes from or is very closely linked to the word kala um, which means to be complete at an end finished accomplished or spent and I've read kala is the Hebrew word most often tr translated as to finish or to complete it first shows up in Bereshit 2 1 I can show you this text here thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them its cognate and closest relative is kala, the Hebrew word for bride. These two words are roughly the same for a very thought-provoking reason. Man is not finished until he and the woman are one. Things are declared good or tov when they are complete. We are told that it is not good that a man should be alone in Bereshit in Genesis 2.18 in the same way life as we know it or the end as some would call it will not come until your messiah comes to take his bride messiah is not complete without his bride that is why the new heaven and the new earth are directly connected to the bride the lamb's wife as adam was alone and in a sense incomplete without his bride or perhaps put another way she completed him so somehow our all-sufficient lord seeks a bride to complete himself as a bridegroom the biblical creation of eve is beautifully foreshadowed beautifully foreshadowed yeshua and his bride adam was put into a deep sleep and sleep is a biblical metaphor for death god opened up adam's side which implies a wound and blood shedding then from his wounded side he created a bride which Adam paid for with the shedding of his own blood Yeshua's side was pierced on the cross apparently Torah anthology records that Adam was on Mount Moriah when God caused him to fall into a deep sleep Yeshua died in the very same place 
When it says Eve was made from Adam's side or his rib, the word is better translated as built, and the bride of Christ is being built as living stones into God's temple on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and Yeshua is the cornerstone in Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. When Eve was complete and ready, this supernatural creation, God presented her to Adam. When the bride of Messiah, this supernatural creation, is complete and ready, God himself will call us up to meet our bridegroom, Yeshua. Adam and Eve would have been glorious, and it is believed they were clothed in light. Rabbinic writings record that they were clothed in garments of light. Oh. This is confirmed in the Chinese language, and of course the Chinese people have lived uh, uh, for the last, they have a, a civilization has lasted for the last about 5,000 years. So leaving, leaving Bavel, they would have taken with them an understanding of the truth of, of the book of Genesis. And they hid it in their writing. It's phenomenal. So I can show you here, for instance, the key for, uh, for word is uh, the, the key for fire is this one here which you can see on the left and that is a picture of a man Ren, you see there with two ticks so that it's it's a stick figure with like a walking person with two ticks representing flames and we can see here one can learn how Adam's body must have been clothed with a glorious shining light hence the flames before sin caused the loss of his perfect character glory and resulted in his nakedness. This is also reflected in the uh, Chinese character for glory. And here also in the, in the character for light, you can see again, you have uh, the radical uh, for the first man, again, looking a little bit like a person walking, and you have fire coming out of them. And you can see it says here, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament wrote, Man is the image of God and the mirror of his glory. Furthermore, in Psalm 104 verse 1 and 2, it gives a description of God. It says, Thou art clothed with honour and majesty. Thou coverest thyself with light as a garment. And being made in the image of, of God, Adam and Eve are likely to have been covered with this amazing uh, garment of, of light. Accordingly, they, they were not naked, not until they sinned, in any case. And in Revelation chapter 3, we see this is yet to come. It says that, to the, that the overcomers will be clothed in raiments of white. And if we look at the word for white in the Greek, it is leukos, and it comes from the word luki, meaning light, meaning light. Wow, we, we will again be clothed in garments of light. And so the fulfilment of all things comes about. Absolutely wonderful. The restoration of all things. Hallelujah. <clears throat> when Eve was deceived and she fell, she would have lost all of this glory and she was condemned to die. Adam, on the other hand, was not deceived like Eve was, but he could not face living without her forever, so he chose to eat knowingly, to sin knowingly, and to embrace death rather than to be without his bride. And apart from the sin, this is so like our own Saviour, our sin of course, our Saviour never sinned of course, but for the sake of his bride he also laid aside his glory, his garments of light, and he embraced death for the sake of his bride. When they sinned, they lost their glory. The bride was naked and ashamed, but God called her to her. And she confessed her sin when she said, The serpent deceived me and ate. And this is the same for us to be his potential bride. God calls to us. And if we will answer and confess our sin, then we can be forgiven and accepted. And for Eve, God slaughtered a lamb to cover her and to cover Adam as well, who had also sinned. Just as God has slaughtered Jesus Yeshua, the Lamb of God, to pay the price to cover our sin. And just by the way, the word for righteousness in Chinese is this pictograph here. It is the Lamb over me. 
absolutely beautiful. There's still so much more I could say, but just one final point about Eve. Her original name was Isha because she was taken out of man, Ish. Her name was changed after the fall to Eve or Chava in Hebrew. This is a derivative of Chai, meaning life. Chava means life or life-giving or mother to all who have life. In Genesis 3.15, God set enmity between the seed of Eve, Yeshua, and Satan between the seed of the bride and the accuser. We know from the parable of the sower that the word of truth that is preached is likened to seed. We are called as the bride of Christ to bring life to others by sharing the word of truth, the seed of the words being spoken out of our mouth, and the word of truth himself, Yeshua, with those who do not yet have life. We know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when the word of God moves from our hearts to our lips and then to the ears of other people and to their hearts, the cycle is complete and we truly become the mother of all spiritual life. It was Eve's calling to be the mother of all life and the first bride of the first Adam. And it is now our calling to be the mother of all spiritual life and to be the bride of the last Adam, Yeshua. I will try to go fairly quickly through the other typologies of the other brides. <clears throat> um, so I've picked six more. So I'll start with Rebecca. So she was the bride for Isaac after the typological sacrifice and re resurrection of Isaac. And the bride of Messiah is called after the resurrection, the crucifixion and the resurrection of Yeshua. Eliezer travelled to a far country to search for Isaac's bride. The Holy Spirit came to earth to find a bride for Messiah. Rebecca came out of Babylon, and we as the bride of Christ are called out of the world system and out of the world system of religion, mystery Babylon. Asenath, Joseph's wife, she was a pagan Gentile, and the bride these days is mostly drawn from the Gentiles with pagan origins. Asenath was given to Joseph after his sufferings and humiliation and at the time of his rejection by his brothers. The bride of Christ is sought after Yeshua's sufferings and humiliations and his rejection by his Jewish brothers. Her marriage to Joseph is associated with the Feast of Trumpets as also is the marriage of the bride of Messiah. Then there's Zipporah, Moses' wife. She was a Gentile daughter of a pagan priest again, like the majority of the Bride of Messiah is made up of Gentiles. She was one of seven sisters. And this is, uh, draws us to a link and a comparison with the seven churches in Revelation. Philadelphia, being one of the seven churches, is a model of the Bride of Messiah in Revelations 2 and 3. Zipporah understood the importance of circumcision and the bride of Yeshua understands the importance of circumcision of the heart versus ritual and religiosity. The next ones we have are Rahab. She was living in a place that was destined for destruction in Jericho. We also are living in a place that is destined for destruction in 2 Peter 3 verse 7. It says, but by his word, the present heaven and earth are being reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly people. Rahab was instructed to stay in the house of refuge from the city of Jericho. The bride will maintain separation from the world. Although Rahab was a citizen of Jericho, she was given a place in the congregation of Israel, and the bride has been grafted into the commonwealth of Israel. Then we have Ruth. <clears throat> Ruth was a Gentile included into Naomi's family, Naomi being an Israelite, and she was included through marriage when Naomi <clears throat> was outside of her homeland in a time of famine. Similarly, the bride of Christ is grafted in, the majority being so during the dispersion of Israel into the nations when she also is spiritually famished. Ruth took bread and wine from the table of Boaz at his invitation. 
Yeshua invites us to eat and drink at his covenant meal. Naomi taught Ruth how to approach Boaz. The Bride of Messiah learned how to approach Israel's God through Israel's scriptures. And Ruth was purchased by Boaz outside the city gate, and the Bride was purchased outside the city gates of Jerusalem. And the last one is the Shulamite. She was from Shulam, which was a territory of Issachar, which was known to have understanding of the times. The Bride of Yeshua must also watch the signs of the times. She fell asleep and she became complacent, as does the bride in Matthew 25, 5 and Revelation 2, 4 and 3, 2. And she is seen as flawless in the Song of Solomon, and the bride will be presented without spot, flaw or wrinkle. There are very many points I could share on each of these. The, the source that I read gave up to like 22 different similarities between uh, the, the brides. However, I'll keep it at that just for now because I think you can get the picture. And the last part I want to come on to, and I do hope you're still with me because this to me is in many ways the most precious part, is the word study and the beautiful things that have been revealed here. So I want to conclude with these word studies, but I do want to make them purposeful so that we don't just have head knowledge, but we have something that we can take away and usefully apply to our lives so that we can be that bride of Christ ready for him. We've seen that uh, the purpose of the church is to be the bride of Messiah, to live and reign at his right hand forever in a close, intimate relationship, the nearest approximation of which here on earth is that of a married couple. And our purpose is also to fulfill, as Eve was meant to fulfill, to be the mother of all life. We are to be the mother of all spiritual life. That is our responsibility as we live on this earth. It's not just about us waiting for our Messiah. We need to be washing our own garments, but encouraging others to wash theirs also. And we've seen that God has reiterated these things over and over in the scriptures, in the plain text that we see, beginning in Ephesians 5, went through the types and typologies uh, that he's um, instilled in the chosen people, the Jews, and in their traditions, in their cultural types and typologies. And we've also seen how the word, our ketubah, teaches us how to live as his betrothed as we await his return. But let's see now what we can find out about how to live um, and how to love the, the Lord God Almighty in what is hidden more deeply in his actual language, perhaps the sowed area of teaching. This is what I've found. And I'm going to start with Enoch because there are not only female, but there are also male types of bride in the scriptures. And that's only fair because apparently I am a son of God and my husband is part of the bride of Christ. It's one of these mysteries, isn't it? So Enoch is also actually a picture of the bride of Christ. And in, we see scriptures here in Genesis 5, Enoch walked with God and, and he was not, he was taken, he was raptured, he was translated for God took him. Um, in Hebrews 11, we, that it was by faith that Enoch was translated. And um, in Jude 1.14, he was the one who prophesied that the Lord came with ten thousands of his saints. Actually, talking of Enoch, uh, that he he walked with God and he was not, for God took him, he was translated, he was raptured. His death was not recorded because there was no death. It is just interesting to note that all the typologies and all the types of the brides that I have referred to in Scripture, not one of them is their death recorded in Scripture, not one of them. Other, other brides, other wives are recorded. Um, Sarah's death, for example, is recorded in Scripture but not one of these who are a beautiful type of the Bride of Christ, which again speaks of the rapture, the being called up to be with the Bridegroom. Anyway, going back to Enoch, <clears throat> and I give, um, I, I've drawn here heavily on uh, an amazing 
Hebrew scholar called Chaim ben Torah, who I highly recommend. I have quoted him here extensively, so I give uh, I give uh, thanks to him and um, make reference to him here. This these a lot of this is not my own writings, but I've drawn from from him. So quoting him here, he says the Aramaic word uh, the Aramaic word used about Enoch is chanavak, which comes from a Semitic root. Chanake, which has the idea of being consecrated, dedicated, and carried away. It is a word that you use when you dedicate a new church building to God. The idea is that it's given wholly and completely to God. He is the total owner of every brick and stone of that building. So too, Enoch was completely given over so completely to God that, that God possessed every fibre of his being. He was so totally at one with God that God was able to take him to heaven. This word also has the idea of not just being consecrated and dedicated, but of being carried away. And it is used by a bridegroom who goes to the house of the father of the bride and picks up his bride and carries her away to his father's house so that she becomes totally one with him and his family. And we've heard about this and this serene, the lifting up and the carrying away of the bride. We've heard about that today. The scripture in Hebrews 11 mentions uh, faith. And we should know the meaning of faith in Hebrew, imuna, um, which means not just to believe in your head, but it means to actually live out, to walk out your faith, to live according to that which you believe. And we saw that in our spiritual forefathers like Noah, who walked with God, and who in Abraham, who obeyed God's commandments. And it was accounted to him to righteousness, this kind of belief, this kind of faith, this imuna. And likewise, we know that Enoch walked with God. So it may seem a little tenuous, but the Hebrew word for walk is halak, which spelt backwards makes kala, bride. This is not the only example we find, for instance, Noah, Noach, written backwards and forwards. One is rest and one is grace. And the context indicates that Enoch, of course, walked faithfully as a consecrated bride. So his halach turned him to a kala, so that God was able to lift him up and carry him away to be his close companion forever, like the Greek paralambano. We, as the bride of Yeshua, are called to walk similarly, and we are promised the same reward, Paralambano. And it was Enoch in Jude who prophesied about the bride returning to earth with her groom. How appropriate. Well, I want to come back to the Ten Commandments, the Ketubah. I said I would return to this because I mentioned earlier that the Torah is not a dictatorial list of do's and don'ts given by a harsh taskmaster simply providing every possible opportunity to highlight our failures. It is God's law of love to keep us safe and consecrated to him as well as to make us a beacon, a city on a hill, a light on a lampstand, the light of the world that we are called by Yeshua to be, to draw others to him, the lost, the Egyptians, to God. So this we know, or we should know. And then I read this. This is, uh, I'm quoting, as I say, from Chaim ben Torah. He says, <clears throat> such an unfortunate word used in English, commandments. God did not consummate his marriage with Moses by giving him ten orders to follow. Cook my dinner, wash my clothes, keep my house, etc. <clears throat> Excuse me. God chose his words very carefully here to show us clearly what the Ten Commandments uh, were all about. He did this by calling Moses his bride. On their wedding night, a bride will often ask her new husband what she can do to show him how much she loves him. The new husband will then reveal his heart to his new bride and reveal some of his deep longings and desires. Perhaps he will tell her, 
not to have any other husband but him. Perhaps, uh, maybe he will ask that she never uses his name in a vain or a derogatory manner. Perhaps he will ask her to have one day during the week that will be reserved for just themselves. He will definitely ask that she not commit adultery or bear false witness that is lying to him. Sure, on their wedding night, both will form a covenant between them with lists of rules that they will follow, rules that will keep declaring their undying love for each other. Do you see how tender and vulnerable this is, that in this way God is revealing the bridegroom's heart that he has for us, for Israel, for us, the Gentiles, for all, who are going to be called to be his bride. He's revealing his bridegroom's heart so tenderly and in such a vulnerable way. That is why when Moses descended from the mountain of God, God's mountain, God gave to Moses, his bride, a list of things he could do to declare his undying love for God, things that were very precious to the heart of God. And if you truly love him, you will follow this list very closely. We call them the Ten Commandments, but they are really ten ways to express your, our love for God. God has laid out to us the desires of his heart like a bridegroom on his wedding night, and he invited us to cherish his heart by cherishing and honouring his desires. How precious and intimate and vulnerable that is from the almighty God of the universe. A little bit more I want to share about the heart. Um, the word for bride is here. It's kala, kof, lamed, he, kala. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride kala, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. Isaiah 62 verse 5. Now, in its primitive form, the word kala has a double lamed, like that, which, and I'm quoting Chaim again here, which represents prayer with uplifted hands. This word is a picture of reaching up to your lover with an open, empty heart, asking him to fill your heart with his presence. The root word is a little strange because it means both a filling or a completion and a wasting away. However, the sages chose this word to represent a bride because a bride is to fill her heart with the desires of her bridegroom whilst her own desires waste away. In another study I saw, the same scholar describes Enoch as an empty pipe pouring forth the Spirit of God, and this tells me how I must live. I must live to be filled with the Spirit of God, emptying myself out and allowing myself to be filled with Him, to be no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. May my oil lamp be full of oil of the Holy Spirit in order that I might be a ready bride. In another word story uh, study, I learned that the sages teach that there are three types of prayer. There's the type of prayer of a child to a parent, please give me, of a wife to a husband, how may I serve you? But there is also a third, which is that of a husband to a wife. And he says, I know that sounds a bit creepy, but consider. A husband wishes to protect his wife's feelings, her heart. He does not want to offend her or wound her heart. God not only made himself vulnerable coming to earth in human flesh to experience our suffering in the flesh, but he has also made himself vulnerable by giving us his heart when we give him ours. As a husband can trample over his wife's heart, so too we can tread over the heart of God and wonder why don't I feel his presence. To pray to God as a husband to a wife, we are seeking to understand the heart of God. Like a husband will spend a lifetime seeking to understand the heart of his wife, he will take his wife's heart in the palm of his hand 
Examine it, protect it, care for it and gently caress it. So too, as we pray, relating to God as our wife, we take the heart of God, understanding it, protecting it, caring for it and gently caressing it. God gave us a marriage relationship to help us understand our relationship with him. It cannot be just one-sided, looking to God as a bride to a bridegroom. There is another side of the coin to consider. Our beloved God has a heart similar to the heart he breathed into us. Just as our hearts can be broken, so too we can break his heart. Once God gave me a dream. In my dream, I was at a supermarket checkout that had some sort of reward system, like the coupons that I can accrue at the supermarket where I shop. I was at the checkout and I was looking at an array of fruit and produce there. There was an enormous, beautiful bunch of black grapes and I was looking longingly at these. I really wanted these. I was handed a coupon, my loyalty reward, and it had the number 38 on it. In my dream, the number separated out into a three and an eight. The reward associated with the three, with the three was a beautiful, fresh, ripe plum tomato that was placed in my hand. And I knew it, it was very delicate and it was very precious and I was grateful. But at first I did not appreciate the preciousness of this reward fully. Then I was shown the reward, the loyalty reward associated with the number eight. To my great excitement, it was that beautiful big bunch of grapes that I had been so desiring. I was excited to receive this reward. Now, there are a number of inter interpretations associated with this dream, and I won't go into them all now, really. The three, the trinity, the grapes, the number eight being the number of Yeshua and so on. But what I want to focus on really is the fact that I was focused on the grapes because I really love grapes, but I didn't at first appreciate the tomato so much. The numbers have meaning individually, but I want to look at the number 38 in more detail because in itself it refers to work, but please also note the references to the heart. So here we see the number 38 uh, we can see that it says um, it is written with the two letters Lamed, authority, and Chet, which is the inner chamber, including the heart. It is the number of work or labor, and it includes the idea of one's calling or one's life work or purpose, for that is the true authority that one possesses in one's heart. I was called to be a teacher, and I knew in my heart I had the authority to fulfill that role. It was my life's purpose, my life's calling. It was the work of my heart not like a part-time job doing, I don't know, pub work or something that I did when I was a teenager. It's quite different. And at the bottom we read here that the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground. And it says this was the crowning achievement. Making us was the crowning achievement of his work of creation. And it was performed by the authority of the heart of God. This was very much, creation of man was very much linked to his heart. So, when I looked up the symbolism of the tomato in the biblical dream interpretation, I found that it represented a heart. And interestingly, just after I'd had this dream, I went out for breakfast with my husband and there was lots of food in the buffet, but there was just one of these tomatoes and I knew that this was for me and so I took a took a photograph of it. So I looked up the symbolism of tomato in biblical dream interpretation and I found it represented the heart. At first I hadn't appreciated this gift but I realized that God had given me his heart as my very great reward, my loyalty reward. And he hasn't just given this to me, he's given this to us all. And we must ask ourselves, will we love and nurture his heart as a husband nurtures his brides? If you'll bear with me, I just want to share two more special treasures from the Hebrew about the bride. So we've already seen that the word kala means finished or complete. This one over here on the right, it says it is finished, it is complete, completed. 
Um, so we've seen that it means finished and that the Jewish literature clearly teaches that man is not kala, complete, until he gets married, and then he is kala, complete. The word kala means both complete and bride because a bride makes a man complete. But thinking about this meaning of the word kala, and I think particularly about the word finished, and I wonder, does that remind us of anything? Well, it certainly reminds me of Yeshua's last statements on the cross. Now, many of us have heard the teaching that he cried out tetelestai in the Greek, which means it is finished, and it is linked with uh, the scroll when there was an indictment against somebody, the, the, if you were put in prison, the, your crimes were written upon this and it was nailed to your door. And when you when you finished uh, your sentence, let's say you had a one year sentence, when you'd paid in full for your crimes, it was written across there, tetelestai, and that was handed to you. So I know that, I know that, it's great. However, I like the Hebrew interpretation as it is far more intimate. So let's look at what the Passion Translation shows. It says, in John 19.30, when he had sipped the sour wine, he said, it is finished, my bride. Then he bowed his head and surrendered his spirit to God. Apparently, the Passion Translation often uses the Aramaic version of the New Testament instead, or together with the Greek text. Normally, the Aramaic text will fill out or give additional meaning to the Greek text in this translation. His cross fulfilled and finished the prophecies of the Messiah's first coming to the earth. There was nothing written that was not fulfilled and now offered to his bride. How beautiful is that? How perfect is that? Kala, kala. Now, since the bride has been there in God's heart and his mind before the foundation of the earth, I felt she had to be hidden somewhere in the beginning, in Bereshit, in Genesis. Now, this may be stretching things a little, I don't know, but I searched for the first place I could make the word Kala in Genesis, in Bereshit, and this is what I found. So if you look here, you can see this is in Genesis 1, uh, and, and God saw that the light was good and and divided God between the light and between the darkness. That's the Hebrew. And you can see that the first letter that I've circled is the Kof in that. And then the Lamed in divided. It's not in and, it's in divided. So we've got that divided. And then the He is in Elohim, in God. That divided God. And if you want to be really pernickety and think back to the proto-Hebrew the um, the one that had the two lamids, you can even find that as well. So we have kof, lamid, lamid, hey, and they are in. The, it is in the words that divided God. Well, we know that it says in Deuteronomy that uh, God is one. He is echad. That is the Shema that the Jewish people say. Um, Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Uh, Hear, O Lord, the Lord our God, the Lord is Echad. It means one, but the word Echad means unity. It means unity. It is, uh, it is a unity between diverse or amongst diversity. Uh, there's a different word which is Yahid, which means one, and that is singular. And if you add anything to Yahid, it is no longer Yahid. But Echad has this idea of unity. And we know that God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit were never divided. They were living in eternity, in perfect unity. And yet, wasn't there a time actually when they were divided? The only time in eternity ever where God has allowed himself to be divided was on the cross when the Father turned his back on his son when Yeshua said 
Why have you forsaken me? And why did he do it? He did it for his kala, that divided God, his kala, his bride. His bride caused him to be divided. He allowed himself to be divided for his bride. And immediately afterwards, after that had happened, he cried out, It is finished, kala, my bride, kala. Oh, my heart. How beautiful is that? And in this part of the scripture, in Genesis 1, in Bereshit, we see that this part of the scripture is all about dividing. It's about dividing the light from the darkness, the waters from the land, the waters above from the waters below. God allowed himself to be divided. We, brothers and sisters, must allow ourselves to be divided too. In the Bible, in the word of God, waters represent peoples. God divided the waters above from the waters below. He will do the same when he comes for his bride, lifting his bride up on high, Paralambano, leaving the waters, the peoples who have rejected him, below, Afiemi. Let us, therefore, divide the light in our lives from the darkness in our lives, that we may be found to be worthy to be his bride. Amen and the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, come Yeshua. Amen.